Yeah, I just pulled up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll call you when I get out. All right, Mike. Hi, okay. I'm Gary Stevens. Supposed to talk to somebody about maybe paying a fine or something? No, actually, this is where your case is looked at for possible completion of community service before you go see Judge Collins. Uh, or you could try to contest. <laughs> Isn't there a way I could just make a donation or something? I'm a really busy guy. No, I'm afraid not. You see, this is your third time speeding through our tiny little town. We kind of look out for our mobility impaired residents here, most of whom just happen to be vets. Yeah. Ones with hysteria. Excuse me. I said, God bless America. Mm. Right. Well, since your patriotism just shines through, this one should make you feel extremely supportive. The Veterans Center? Well, you want me to volunteer at the Veterans Center? Well, that's up to you, after all. God bless America, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Hey, remember, those hours need to be completed before you see Judge Collins. Hey, uh, Mike. Yeah, something's come up. I'm, I'm going to be here in, in Yonville for a bit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, don't ask. Look, I'll, uh, I'll email you the files tomorrow, okay? All right, talk to you then. Bye. Hey, uh... Is there somebody I can talk to about maybe getting these uh, signature for these community service hours? Sure you can. I'm Byron Grant, by the way. Sergeant Major Byron Grant. Yeah. Chief Administrative Assistant here, United States Marine Corps. Hey, we sure appreciate the help around here. Oh, I'm, I'm not here by choice. I just want to get this done. Oh, okay. Well, being that you don't really want to be here, I wouldn't want you to be beholden anyone. So why don't we head on inside and see if we can get a better fit for you? I really appreciate this, Mr. Grant. Call me Byron. Right. Mr. Jenkins, is your prescription here? No. No? no. Sorry about that. I'm personally looking at that. Okay. Let's get you squared away. Who is that? You don't mind me asking? Oh, well, that's Roger Taney. The folks around here, they call him Recall. Lovingly, I might Recall? What kind of name is that? Well, Roger has a snack for remembering just about every veteran's name in the state that has been either wounded or killed since World War II. And it always amazes me. It is amazing. I wonder, uh... What's that? Well, my granddad served. Ah, but he wouldn't remember him. He didn't really do much, and then he was killed. Well, there's no harm in asking. I'll tell you what. Why don't we make a wager? <coughs> if Roger remembers your grandfather, he'll be your volunteer hours. If he doesn't, I'll sign your hour card. Deal? Deal. Kids these days, follow me. <laughs> Roger, this is... What did you say your name was again? Stevens. Uh, Gary Stevens Eddie is my full name. You wouldn't be related to Lance Corporal Frank, Eddie. Uh, that's my grandfather's name. How did you guess that? Son, to me, every single bit matters. And each one that we lose deserves to be remembered. Uh, yeah, but from you know what I was told, he didn't do much. I, I mean, he didn't even win a single medal. Son, do you think that's what serving's all about? Winning medals? Not a single man or woman goes in looking to just win a medal. If they do, it was earned. They have never won. Well, I still don't know very much about him. That's okay, son. We'll both have plenty of time to figure that out. Now that you've just doubled your volunteer hours. Oh, we'll man. Have plenty of time to find out who your grandfather was. Y yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, Mike, um, look, something's come up. I'm, I'm going to be out for a while, for a couple of days. Yeah, look, I'll just use my vacation time, all right? Okay, all right, Mike, I'll talk to you later. Bye. So, what can you tell me about my grandfather? Let me think. 
Lance Corporal Eddie born 1916. When World War II came along, he along with so many other red blooded Americans swelling with patriotism during the war. That's important because the average age of the enlisted man was four to five years younger. Naturally, they began calling him Pops. Huh. Yeah, I remember a while back seeing some letters with the name Pops written on them. Son, what you have in those letters is a treasure. Some families never heard from their loved ones again. All they got was a simple knock on the door. The saddest thing I ever read was from the military's burial detail and grave registration. On one block, just one square block, 15 men were lost. Their families notified. It was as if that itself had drifted door to door. Lance Corporal Frank Pops Eddy was one of those 15. Wow. I had no idea. Son, do you know why we celebrate Memorial Day? Well, it does seem like a strange thing to celebrate. I mean, people lost their fathers, their mothers, their sons, their husbands. But what's there to celebrate? Well, among all the barbecues and fireworks, I always hope people take a moment to commemorate their lives, to remember the things they believe are worth living and dying for. And it's not just those who serve in the love of the country that we honor. It's the people who love those who have served, so that the families of the fallen know they won't be left behind. When we signed up, we became part of the community. And that community doesn't die. Darling Diamond, I've decided to share with you that I've devised a plan to visit our wartime friends in Europe during Christmas, and I'm bringing you with me. Oh, so sweet of you, sweetheart Ruby, for sharing your plans with me. I shall be ready. Is there anything I need to take care of before we leave for Europe? Darling Diamond, yes. Oh. We need a passport, a visa, well, certificate oh. and two airplane tickets, one for me and one for you. Oh, sweetheart Ruby. Um, I, I shall be ready. Um, don't worry, I have contacted the passport and the uh, European Embassy to kindly plead with them that they send a passport and grant a visa to both of us. Darling Diamond, what was the response from the passport office and the EU embassy? Oh, well, um, the passport office has sent the passports and the EU embassy has given the grant of visa to both of us. Oh, Darling Diamond, wonderful. <laughs> Can you please purchase two tickets for both of us for our journey? Oh, uh, yes. Um, I have purchased two tickets for both of us to leave next Tuesday at 10 o'clock in the morning. Darling Diamond, great <laughs> job. So, we shall leave early for Amethyst International Airport. Yes. And we will get there and take the wheelchair from the parking lot over to the airplane and board. On Tuesday, Diamond takes Ruby in his wheelchair to the Amethyst International Airport, pushing the wheelchair near the airport. Diamond and Ruby take some time to orient themselves to the airport, navigating a space that is not intended to accommodate Ruby's physical needs as a wounded veteran. Chelsea Dome, a devoted flight attendant, sees them. Oh. Would you need assistance to board? Oh yes, um, dear Chelsea <laughs> Um, my sweetheart Ruby will need to be lifted out of his wheelchair in order to board the airplane. Chelsea Dunny uh, immediately, with kindness, care, and courtesy, steps down the airplane stairs and assists Diamond and Ruby really out of the wheelchair. However, unfortunately, sadly and suddenly, <laughs> Diamond falls out of him. Both Chelsea Dunny and Ruby's hands fall down to the ground unconscious. Swiftly, Chelsea Dunny checks bodies. Then, uh -huh. looks at Diamond, shaking his okay. head. It is so hard to accept that, after all he survived in the war, my sweetheart Ruby has come to his untimely end, while looking forward to joyous times with his wartime friends. Because of these inadequate accessibilities, 
at the airport. This has happened, his untimely demise. But my sweetheart Ruby always lived with empathy and compassion. And so shall I, his darling diamond. Oh my God, that's awful. <laughs> And it's not just that veterans' accessibility needs aren't considered. Oftentimes, they're not even accommodated, which just adds such frustration. Really? But in all these, you've heard the saying, got your six? We always have each other's back around here. Something like our motto, you've got to take care of your own. Well, how do you manage that? Well, around here, the Marines love celebrating the Marine Corps' birthday. Some will get you to believe it's bigger than Christmas. <laughs> oh, and they do a good job of celebrating, passing out cupcakes. But it's also a time to remember the things that are most important to us, even those of us who aren't jarheads. And along the way, it's the little things we do for each other. support from family or friends outside. Yet he has a cup of coffee every day, eight to ten cups a day. You know, there are many kinds of intelligence, like logic and math, verbal and music, and even proprioceptives like sports and dance. I guess George, living on the sandbars, learned learn how to hustle using streetwise intelligence. My sister Terry sent it to me. Must be on the New York Times bestsellers list. Sorry, Steve. The news I got last night was tough. Her cancer is really very bad. I'm sorry to hear it's understandable. You know, there's no crime in prison. I'm sorry to hear she's having a tough time. You know, thanks, Steve. She already endured a double mastectomy. About a year later, she didn't feel so good. The clinic won't get her an MRI. She can't work. The Social Security denied her any benefits. She doesn't have any money, not even for her MRI. Well, her cancer has gone behind her breastplate, down her spine, into her pelvis and hip. Now it's coming back up, going for through her neck, going for her brain. Lesions are forming around her neck and her eye, man. Damn, that's really messed up. Can they do anything for her? Does she have much time left? You know, Terry has maybe one or up to three months left. The doctor has stopped the chemotherapy. It quit working. They're just giving her 300 milligrams of morphine every day. Damn it, man. And I'm sitting here in prison, convicted of attempted murder, a crime I did not even commit. And you've fought your case against the most notorious district attorney. Mean, wicked, unscrupulous. Peter, though you have a good reason, you can't let yourself get depressed. Uh, if you do, they win. No! <laughs> all right, all right. Hey, 
Hey, Steve. Hey, Ryan. Steve. You guys got anything to eat? Ryan, did you eat your breakfast when they dumped it in our cell today? Uh, no, I, d I didn't get any breakfast. Say what, they skipped you? I'll talk to JT to ensure you get your breakfast tomorrow. Thanks, Dave. I'll be right back. Hey, Ryan, you want any coffee? Sure. I got you. Here, yeah, Ryan. Mm. There's wow. some peanut butter and jelly from yesterday. And milk and cereal. Wow. And a soup. Take wow. it all. Thanks. Oh. Ryan, there's some brown stuff on your nose, man. <laughs> <laughs> you like a mirror? Mm. No, it's just coffee. Coffee? <laughs> Man, did you snort that coffee I gave you? <laughs> I was just joshing with you when I said the powdery keep coffee is for snorting. <laughs> hey, does it work? <laughs> How did you sleep? <laughs> hey, here we go, Ryan. Mm. Uh, I'll catch you guys get guys later. I gotta duck it. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Was it that coffee or stress keeping you away? Definitely stress. Hey, you got any string? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was definitely stress, you know. Uh, every stress, man. When I. Think about being back in Afghanistan, you know? When I stood my patrol. Uh, man, that's why uh, they found me sleeping under the bunk, you know? I guess they missed me when they came by for breakfast, you know? You know, Ryan, you shouldn't be here in prison, man. I know. Uh, wow. I don't blame him for calling the cops, you know? Man, see, when every time uh, I go through these spells, you know? See, man, I hate these intense dreams that I'll be having, you know? I hate them, you know, all these distractions and all. I had to shoot that kid. I had to. He was coming at us. He had grenades in his hands. And before I knew it, the pins were pulled. Oh my God. I had to shoot him. And when I sat him, the grenades went off. Oh, and they blew him into pieces. Man, why? Why? Why do they have to use kids? Huh? You couldn't have been no more than 12 years old! Why? <sighs> Ryan, have you spoken to the VA rep since you got locked up? Uh, no. Do you mean there's a VA rep? Yeah. Uh, there's a regional office nearby. Uh, if you don't mind, I can talk to my sister, get in touch with the VA rep, and let them know that you are here. I like that a lot, Peter. Thank you. No. Here's a piece of paper. Write your name, your military ID, and your service dates. Okay. I'll let you eat and chill. Once I talk to my sister, I'll get back to you. Thanks, Peter. And if you need anything, just ask. Thanks, Peter. Hey, you got shot coffee? Come in and have a seat. 
Are you okay, Captain? All right. This is a continuation of our psychological evaluation that we started last week. For your board here, do you have to go over any of the rights again? No, I remember them. Oh, excellent. Good. Let's get started then. At our last meeting, Mr. Taylor, we were just getting to your uh, memories about the end of your Vietnam military service. And I had asked you to think about what took place and how it affected you. Did you do that for me? Yeah, I gave it some thought. But I don't understand what this has to do with my board hearing. We'll touch on that before you leave. For now, why don't you tell me about the part you played in those events. You were on the uh, SS Kirk at the fall of the Saigon. How did you end up there when, according to the records I have here, I've looked at, you weren't really assigned to any military unit at all? Again, Doctor, I don't understand what this has to do about the charges against me or the nearly 40 years I've done in prison. You let me worry about that, Mr. Taylor. Now, please, answer my question. How did you end up on a combat ship off the coast of Vietnam where uh, apparently you had no business being? The Kirk was a destroyer escort. History seems to remember its only mission as being an anti-submarine hunter-killer. But the Kirk's <coughs> legacy is bound to compassion and mercy. It was a key part in the evacuation of thousands of refugees. Uh, I don't understand how a ship built to kill people could have had much to do with compassion or mercy. Well, you ask me how I ended up on the Kirk, and I'm telling you, my being there wasn't on a lark. In fact, so much of it was Beyond my control, context matters. Now, yeah, fine, fine. I'll give you some rope. Look, my father was an Air Force intelligence officer with friends in the Navy and... Yes, yes, it's all here in your file. So, I was there in Long Beach on the day the Kirk was commissioned, 1972. Now, at the time, I didn't think her history would go any further than that. But by 75, South Vietnamese were in dire straits, and the People's Army was rapidly advancing towards Saigon. You've uh, said all this before. You were, oh, let's see, where did I see that? Worried about the civilians and the families of your friends. So you were hired by the Flying Tiger Airlines, which you say was a CIA front. And uh, what's this Task Force 76? <laughs> I was in Saigon, mid-April 75, organizing aircraft to evacuate families of RVN officers. RVN, that's Republic of Vietnam. Evacuating their families and destroying aircraft that were going to be left behind. Now by the end of April, the Kirk was one of 26 ships that made up Task Force 76, implementing Operation Frequent Wind, the evacuation of Saigon. Yes, it says right here, over 7,000 evacuees were flown from the embassy and a nearby air base to ships offshore. I suppose this makes you a real hero. Well, it wasn't about that or me, it was a madhouse. And those of us who could fly, did. Trying to save as many innocent people as we could. Oh, uh, fine, what happened? Mr. Taylor? Mr. Taylor? Huh? Yeah, okay, I said what happened? Within hours. Desperate air crews ferried everyone from their favorite hookers to families. The Kirk took in dozens of evacuees from over a dozen South Vietnamese helicopters, but the small deck required that the crews quickly unload and then push each helicopter over the side and into the sea. 
to make space for the next. Some aircraft were too large to land and they just hovered over. And then the passengers, they jumped off onto the safety of the deck. They deliberately crashed into the sea knowing that they would be rescued by the sailors. Yeah, yeah. and we're here to talk about your part in these events, Mr. Taylor. We're talking about sacrifice. Oh, is that how you see yourself, a martyr? I was doing my duty. I was doing what was right. I hear a lot of talk about what was going on. But what were you doing? Well, after ferrying families to the safeties of the ships, I flew a chopper to cover the fleet as it streamed away from Vietnam. And shortly after, the Kirk was ordered to sail 50 miles off of Vietnam's southern coast to rescue the Vietnamese Navy. <laughs> it seems someone had forgotten that. And we, if we didn't get there in time, all those people probably would have been killed. So, uh, what did you find when you got there? Two days into the evacuation, there were scores of Vietnam Navy ships, fishing boats and other craft and other shapes, jammed with refugees. At least 20,000 of them. Maybe even closer to 30. <laughs> The Kirk's crew repaired those that we could and abandoned the rest. Finally working with just 32 ships and what people were calling the Voyage to Freedom. Uh, it says right here that you abandoned a ship on your own. Weren't you a pilot? <laughs> what made you qualify to captain the ship? We did what we had to do. If we didn't know, we learned fast. We only spent a day on repairs and then we were off on our thousand mile trek to Subic Bay in the Philippines. I captained a ship with over 700 women and children. After four days at sea, the fleet got to Subic Bay, but the Philippine government denied us access until the, every Vietnamese ship was disarmed. We spent the day confiscating thousands of guns and rifles and larger munitions and just dumping them over the side of the ships. A more serious condition, however, was that the Philippine government had officially recognized South Vietnam's new communist government. And the yeah. Republic of Vietnam no longer existed. Yeah, yeah. At noon on May 7th, the Vietnamese crews gathered at attention of their respective ships struck their colors and raised the stars and stripes, officially returning the ships to the U.S. Navy list. Look, later, later that day, the 32 ships entered Subic Bay. And you were all heroes. If you already know everything, why are you asking me all these questions? This evaluation is for your benefit, Mr. Taylor. It's, I'm just trying to understand your recollection of your past and how you've come to terms with your choices. Choices? In my eyes, there was no choice. It was about doing what was right. Huh. Right for you or right for your evil? What was right to save lives? The rescue of tens of thousands of refugees was one of the greatest humanitarian missions in the history of the U.S. military. I think that most of us think that and are proud of the part that we did in the evacuation. Uh, yeah, I see. You see what? Mr. Taylor, I've heard today an, an old man determined to live in his past. That may not be altogether healthy, especially when your past has such foundations in violence and taking the matters of the world into your own hands. You need to think about this, Mr. Taylor. You have clearly had a long list of moments in your life when you were willing to play God. I have no doubt that it was quite an ego trip for you to set yourself up in these positions of supreme authority where you and you alone decided the fate of thousands of people. 
But in America, in the 21st century, there is no place for brutish cowboy thugs like you or your six-gun lifestyle. We were trying to save people. I doubt that, Mr. Taylor. You were there only for the glory of your own ego, like all military men. You are going to find, Mr. Taylor, that most professionals today are not taken in by yellow journalism or the military-industrial complex. Yet another reason we need to keep men like you in places like this. The last thing we need is for the young people outside these walls to be confused with the twisted lies or false words. I think this conversation took a turn somewhere. Aren't we here about my upcoming board meeting? As a matter of fact, yes, we are. And you will find that my recommendation that you be kept in prison the rest of your life is taken very seriously by the board. This story you've told me and what it is in this file that interests me and more examples of why that recommendation needs to be followed. This reads like some ultimate fantasy of a serial killer, Mr. Taylor. With our government acting like your war codependent spouse, Six-day war in '67, Pakistan in '72, Vietnam, the Yom Kippur War in '73, Angola in '76, Cambodia in '79, Central America in 1980, the Falklands in '82. It was my job. Go, no, crying out loud. Yes, the perfect job for someone who thrives on death and suffering of others. Now, Mr. Taylor, to the educated elite of the modern society, you are the perfect example of everything that was wrong with our country in the 20th century. The ugly American who fails to see the part he played in the nightmares that drove our world to the edge of extinction. And now, and now you want to come before the board, beg to be forgiven, and be released back into society. How many thousands of people have you killed, Mr. Taylor? You can't even answer that, can you? I was, and still am, a soldier. I did what was right, I never hurt anyone who didn't deserve it. It was my duty. Oh, uh, yeah, another excuse, Mr. Taylor. You always have an excuse, don't you? You were following orders. Your country told you to do it. You were protecting Vietnamese prostitutes. Rich men kill the woman you love. A psychopath can always justify his actions. I believe that you enjoy the excitement of killing. And as long as your country could use your services overseas, you were happy. But when the world started to change and seek more peaceful solutions than war and murder, you could no longer find the legal targets for your men. So, ah, you murdered the first victim that came along. Do you have anything more to say, Mr. Taylor? Not under these conditions. Perhaps at some point in the future. That could be interpreted as a threat, Mr. Taylor. I suggest you remain the strong, silent type that was always so popular among your part generation. Because anything I can or will say will be used against me, right? Yes, whatever the case. I am not impressed by your attitude. All right, Mr. Taylor. You'll receive a copy of my report to the BPH in the next four weeks. Guard! Guard, we're done here.
America, land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountains to the prairies. To the oceans, what we born. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my. are so important. You talk of heroes. Some of the greatest heroes this country has ever seen are right here in the town of Yonkville that she's been through. Others are some 20, 30 miles away and they're all alone. We all pass on at some point. But our stories, what we live. Wait, wait, he died in prison? Wait a minute, you're telling me that the same U.S. government that sends people off to fight for their freedoms and then locks them up? That just doesn't seem right. I mean, th there's something we've got to be able to do about it, right? I didn't say he died, but yes, veterans are incarcerated. It's complicated. In fact, some go directly from military service to jail with no stop home in between. Uh, man. Well, I feel like there's got to be something we can do. I mean, what about, what about that guy, Ryan? The one who was sleeping underneath his bunk, the one with PTSD. I mean, there's got to be programs for, for folks like him, right? To find him housing, meaningful work. I mean, oh. Somebody could have told him about the fact that there was a VA that could help him on the inside. Nobody bothered to tell him. For all the talk, of supporting our troops and honoring vets. Oftentimes, it just starts with talk. My name is William, but my mom's Mexican. William in Spanish is Guillermo. That's Emo. Huh. I didn't think of that. What about you? Is Jules short for Juliet? No, just Jules. Oh, like burn. No. <laughs> Jules. J-E-W-E-L-S. That's unusual. My parents were hippies that missed the 60s by a decade. Now that's funny. Oh, yeah. It's funny now. Try growing up with it. I can see how that might have been tough. Kids can be cruel, but makes you stronger. You know, I don't know what's going to wear out first, your finger or that ring. <laughs> uh, it's just a, a bad habit I picked up. You want to talk about it? Nothing to talk about. We were together, now we're not. It doesn't matter. Well, it must matter. I mean, you're still wearing the ring. Hey, maybe it's none of your business. I'm sorry. I apologize. I sometimes speak without thinking and the word just right through the filters. No, I'm sorry. I really shouldn't have. Maybe we can start over. What do you do? Well, I'm not saving lives. You really didn't? Yeah. When you're not saving lives. Well, I was in hospitality, but things have been up in here the last few months. Hospitality? Yeah. 
hospitality. You know, restaurants, but with the pandemic and all. Oh, yeah, no, everything's different. I came back and found out everything had changed. It's one thing to see it on the news or read about it, but it's another thing to live it. Not bad. What were you doing? Fighting a war? That's exactly what I was doing. I'm if you don't say sorry. There's one thing I learned in the Army is that you don't apologize for nothing. You fix what needs to be fixed, you move on. Show strength. I'm so okay. Army. Yeah. Two tours in Afghanistan. Just got back stateside last month. Oh, okay. Oh, God. If you say thank you for your service, I'm going to pour a cup of coffee on your head. Fair enough. I appreciate you preserving our freedom. I think I like that better. But everyone has their reasons. For joining? Mm. And yours? I don't think I know anymore. I mean, I enlisted right out of high school. I wasn't going to college. I didn't have anyone or anything keeping me here, so why not? Then I deployed, and it felt like I was really part of something. Good? Oh, not necessarily good, but bigger. Wow. And I felt like I was a part of something where we had each other's backs. I never had that before. Wow. But it wasn't all good. We saw and did some things, but had each other's backs when it mattered. It was as good as it got. Well, it wasn't. Oh, I don't even know why I'm telling you this. I don't know. You know, they say traumatic events have a way of connecting people. Talking about, you know, you almost getting hit by a car, <laughs> me getting you out of harm's way, you're right into a puddle. Oh, well, he's getting hit by a car if you say so. Oh, either way, it seems like you live. I mean, really live. I did feel alive, you know. I've never really talked to anyone with my time there. I mean, they tried to get me to talk to someone, but I mean, she'd never understand. Well, I can't promise you all understand. But I'll listen. Hmm. Well, like I said, it was about as good as it got for me. You know, we spent so much time together. No, um, they, they were my family. We spent so much time together. But then after so much time together, we were bound to lose someone, whether to combat or just moving on. Don't. It. We were en route. We were en route back to base from patrol. Uh, three Humvee convoy. IED took the first. I was in the third and we took fire. Hey, don't you fucking apologize! I'm sorry, you don't understand me. We won! <laughs> no one died. O only minor injuries, even to those in the first tummy. That's amazing. Yeah, we got them. We were pretty fucking proud of ourselves. But it wasn't over. When we radioed for extraction, they sent a, a heavy to come get us but there wasn't enough room, so the two of us without any injuries, we said we'd stick around and wait for the next go around. An IPG got him. A uh, 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 grenade, a uh, one in a thousand shot. Just like that, they were gone. They were all gone. They tried to get me to talk to someone, but what is talking going to do? It's not going to bring anyone back from the dead. She made it back home. Yeah. The time was 
I was almost up when I had a chance to come back here. This was never my home. They were my home. I had a chance to come back here, not home. And this wasn't the place I left. And, you know, they, they said that we were heroes. They said that we were the good guys, but like I said, this wasn't the place I left. I, I, I wasn't expecting a parade, but I, I at least wanted, God, I don't know what I wanted, but it wasn't this. Alone with my thoughts, wondering why me surviving, but feeling like I'm the ghost. Say. You don't need to say anything. You said you'd listen and you did. There's nothing more I can do. <laughs> no. Look, you seem like a nice guy, and <coughs> sometimes there just isn't anything more you can do. There isn't anything anyone can do. Wait, I hate to leave it like this. Can we exchange information? No! Look, let's just leave it as it is, okay? You really given me the first conversation I've had in months and I appreciate that, but let's just leave it like this. Oh, wow. It's really coming down out there. Hey, do me a favor and <coughs> order yourself a cup of coffee. You know, it, it's it's bound to stop and, and there's no need for us both getting French. You seem like a nice guy, you've really frightened my day, but there's something I gotta do. Bye, my mom. See you around, Jules. No, you won't. Oh, God, it's still out of nowhere. There's nothing I can do. Roughly 17 veterans commit suicide each day. 50% more than that of civilians. Excuse me, gentlemen. Mr. Stevens, thank you for your time today. You'll be back tomorrow to complete more of your service? Oh, I can't believe how much time we spent talking today. But Oh my God, you're right, I need to complete my service hours. What? Well, the hours you spent today will count towards your service. I'll see you tomorrow. My service? What, it, it hardly seems like, hardly seems like service compared to what you've been telling me about. Trust me, you coming in was important. That's how these stories are passed on. And there's another service you can provide if you choose to, now that you've heard them. Hey, recall. Yes? What about you? What about me, son? You made it home. You made it back all right. Son, I served in World War II, Korea, finally Vietnam. After my last tour of duty, the family picked me up at Travis Air Force Base. When we got past the gates, the people protesting hippies through feces at the car. When we got to Hamilton and Marin, more protest, more feces. Actual shit was thrown on me. Even worse were the names that they called me. But when we got on the base, the Vietnamese that were being housed there temporarily were waiting for me, screaming my name, yelling, trying to tear my clothes, <laughs> treating me as if I was Elvis. I'm standing there in this broken condition wondering how do I take this from these people that are supposedly so different. It brought me to tears. The emotion was so raw. It was overwhelming. How are you doing, Recall? It's been a long day of remembering, hasn't it? When we started talking, I didn't think he'd understand. But as we continued, he began to realize the impact of these stories. Maybe not like most veterans, 
but he was here to sit and listen and do the things he could do. Hey, recall. Yes. I still think he's a far cry from the esteem folks have for you around here. Well, he'll just have to try harder tomorrow. <laughs> yes, he will. Come on, let me buy you a cup of coffee. Make sure it's decaf. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.